Is the volume okay or is it too loud or? It's okay, yeah. So then I'm going to take over uh, on the hydraulic systems lectures. Uh, so Runal has been doing it up until now. And uh, I know he's had, uh, he's had a couple of examples with you, some, uh, uh, some fluid dynamics that you've been uh, working on a little bit. I will have less of that now for just a little while because I'm going to more present components in the hydraulic systems and stuff. So it will be more, more of a uh, uh, theoretical and not so much uh, calculating uh, stuff. But we will try to uh, try to get in a couple of uh, couple of assign assignments as we go along where we can can do some examples and stuff. Uh, I'm going to try out something new in these hydraulic uh, uh, lectures. Uh, basically because I am studying to become learning lots of different tips and uh, tricks that I can use myself. So I'm going to start off by presenting our learning goals for this. Uh, this one isn't on. Uh, the goals that we are going to attempt to learn during this lecture. And then at the end of the lecture we're also going to have a summary of those goals just to see what we've been through. So our learning goals will be to be able to explain throttle points and the effect of throttling. So we have already, uh, you have already had throttling in uh, fluid dynamics and stuff, but now we're just going to repeat it a bit. We're going to be able to explain cavitation and the effects of cavitation. Now I can't really remember the details of everything you did in fluid dynamics, but I think you touched upon cavitation a bit at least, but I'm not going to say that completely for sure. But we are at least going to look a bit at what, what cavitation is and the negative effects it can have on our systems. Or not can have, that it will have if it occurs. We're going to become more familiar with uh, different hydraulic fluids, different kinds of oils and uh, also uh, other fluids than oils that can be used as hydraulic fluids. We're going to become familiar with the role of viscosity in hydraulic fluids. So I know we've already, already talked a bit about viscosity in the Reynolds number and everything with Runal. So we are going to look a bit uh, more at what exactly is viscosity and what's the role it plays in the hydraulic fluids. We're going to be able to distinguish the properties of hydraulic fluids based on their viscosity index. And then we start off with our throttle points. That was the... That was the uh, top point there, learn more about throttle points. So I'm going to try to follow this, this sequence as we go along. So throttle points is the first one. <coughs> and we have this figure 2.20 in our uh, book that we can look a bit at. You've already seen something similar with Runal where it has the, the force being applied on one side and in this case, uh, force being applied on the other side also, but that would be like having something heavy on top of that piston. And as this fluid is supposed to be moving from one side to the other, it has to pass through this point, which is, has a narrower, narrower cross-section. And that is throttling. So we are going to just throttle down the, the flow through that point. And Let's see here. There it is. So at the start of the throttling point, we are going from this side and over to that side. So at the start there, we need a Reynolds number that is hopefully below 2300 in order to keep it a laminar flow. It's the critical Reynolds number. But often in this cross-section, it will be laminar over here, be below 2,300, but it will very quickly rise above 2,300 as soon as it's entering this throttle point. And that is due to the, the narrower uh, cross-sectional area. <coughs> yeah, uh, as it hits, as it moves from this larger pipe and into the smaller part section of the pipe, it will very quickly reach the uh, critical Reynolds number, which is 2,300. So it will pass above it. The way this is 
done is by uh, the fluid reaching its critical velocity very quickly. And this means that our flow will turn from laminar to turbulent. And as soon as we have a turbulent flow, there is a whole lot of stuff that we can't explain with mathematics. Uh, we can do pretty accurate uh, estimations uh, due, using uh, uh, calculation software, but we can't explain turbulence. There isn't a single equation that explains turbulence completely. So we don't really know what happens inside the turbulence. If we had managed to figure that one out, if, if some of you in the future managed to figure out how to explain turbulence completely with mathematics, you'll get a Nobel Prize, without a doubt. That's, uh, th that's how important this stuff is, and, but nobody has been able to do it yet. And if we could explain turbulence, we could actually predict weather much more, because we could explain the turbulence in the air uh, with the weather patterns and everything. We could uh, probably create uh, most, most things that involve fluids uh, much more efficiently than, uh, than uh, we do now, because we could, could very accurately uh, predict the effects of the turbulence, such as a ship moving through water, it will create turbulence, uh, turbulence in the water behind it. This uh, means that it's using more, more energy than actually needed. If it could have passed through the water, with, uh, creating as little turbulence as possible, it would use less energy to move forward. Uh, the same with flows through pipes and everything. Uh, if we can keep it laminar or at least minimize the turbulence as much as possible, then we can uh, can uh, increase our efficiency. So this is something that's really, really important to us. But the point here is that when we are throttling, it is almost impossible to avoid a turbulent flow. So it will very quickly reach the critical velocity. And you've uh, talked with Runal about this, that if you then afterwards want to uh, return it from a turbulent flow and back to a laminar flow, you need to go very far below 2300 before it returns to the laminar flow. So it's a half or just one third or something that you need, you need to reduce it to in, order to in order to return to the laminar flow. Then we'll look at what's happening in the throttle point. So our energy is a, uh, has to remain constant because we have the conservation of energy. No matter where we look, energy is conserved, which means that our energy also must be conserved through the throttle point. And this means that our kinetic energy has to be increased. And our kinetic energy is, of course, tied to our velocity. So this means that our velocity is increasing. And again, it was the velocity that caused our Reynolds number to rise so much that we got a turbulent flow in there. The way this has happened is that some of the energy in the pressure inside the fluid has been turned into kinetic energy. Because we can't just gain kinetic energy without moving it from something else. Because energy is neither created nor destroyed. So it has moved from the pressure and into the kinetic energy range. This means that we have increased friction inside the fluid. And if we have inside, uh, increased uh, friction, uh, the fluid will become heated, which means that we have an increase in heat energy also. So we are both increasing our kinetic energy and our heat energy. And most of it is coming from our pressure. So now we'll look a bit at what happens after the throttle point. So after the throttle point, we suddenly have uh, regained our cross-sectional area. So our velocity returns to the initial state. If this has been designed correctly, the Reynolds number will drop sufficiently that we, we will return to a laminar flow. But before we got there too, we had pressure energy that had been converted into heat energy. 
which means that we had less energy for our pressure, so our pressure has been decreased. <clears throat> so using throttle points is, uh, in fact, a way of uh, decreasing our pressure in the system. This means that we, of course, have a power loss here. So if we want to, if we want to uh, preserve the power that we put into this side and get as much as possible pos uh, power out on this side, we can't have a throttle point between them. Then we would have to have the same size linking both here. So the throttle point would have to go completely away if we were to avoid a power loss due to this. But throttle points are many kinds. Uh, you can, uh, like we have seen in underwater technology, you can insert valves whose sole purpose is to throttle the flow. But also just the, the point of going from, from maybe an internal section through a coupling and into a hose to moving it. Somewhere along uh, that line, uh, between, um, most likely in the coupling, there will be a smaller cross section so that you will have a slight throttle point there. And this may, might happen on every single connection that you have. Uh, during a system, so um, the larger your system is, the more small throttle points you can have. And this is something that we need to, to think a bit about when we are doing it. So it doesn't necessarily mean, a throttle point doesn't mean that you have uh, designed it so that there is supposed to be throttling there. It might just be that the components you are using end up as a throttling point. So it's nice to keep that in mind when we are designing a hydraulic system that uh, diff uh, changes in the cross-sectional area will act as throttle points. <clears throat> so we're going to look a bit more at the, the viscosity. It's here. And we can use viscosity to, d to detect the power loss. In, uh, during the uh, throttle point and flow velocity can, uh, can also tell us about the power loss also the shape and length of the throttling point will tell us something about the power loss and of course the type of flow because even though it is very easy to achieve a turbulent flow through the uh, throttle point it might not necessarily be achieved. So you might have a laminar flow going through there. If it's just a very small throttling there, it, it might be sufficient that you keep the laminar flow going through the throttle point. So one way of uh, discovering this power loss is to look at the hagen poiseuille equation. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing this correctly, which is that we look at the flow. I know the book uses the Q, but I know that uh, Runald uh, prefers using the, the dotted V. To show the, show the flow rate. And we also uh, have the, um, the alpha here, which is the flow index, and it is constant. And we have the cross-sectional area that we are uh, that the flow is going through, which is of course also constant. In if we are looking at a single section through here, the cross-sectional area will be constant there. <coughs> the number two is of course a constant, and we also have the density of the hydraulic fluid, which is also constant. So all of these parts of this equation are constant. The only thing that changes is the pressure drop, which means that we can pretty accurately say something about the power loss over a throttle point just by looking at, at the square root of the drop in pressure. So that if we, can, if we measure the pressure on this side of the throttle point and measure the pressure on the other side, we can fairly accurately calculate uh, the change 
we have there. So we can use this as a, as a way of, way of uh, putting numbers to, to the power loss we have. <coughs> so in other words, the, the flow rate that we get through this uh, throttle point is completely dependent on the difference in pressure that we get from one side to the other. So, but this means that we, are, we have, can have a fairly high pressure on this side and we can get a fairly low pressure on the other side of the throttle point. And this is where we can end up getting the cavitation that we are going to look at next. So, as it exits, as the fluid exits the, uh, the throttle point, the pressure drops and you can end up uh, end up forming bubbles inside the fluid simply because the the, uh, uh, the pressure has dropped so much that you uh, sort of it's not really boiling exactly but but you end up uh, getting uh, bubble formations inside there and they, they are basically filled with air and oil vapor uh, these bubbles <coughs> but then as we move a little bit further along, the pressure will rise a bit more because it's, this is exactly in the, in the most turbulent part where it is exiting the throttle point. And as we move a bit further uh, on there, the bubbles will collapse. And inside these very tiny bubbles that are formed, there is a huge amount of energy. And this energy will very easily easily start destroying the material of the pipe you have there. So uh, whether it's a pipe or a rubber hose or whatever it is, it will very quickly start uh, destroying the material. <coughs> you can actually, uh, it has happened that the hydraulic fluid has self-ignited due to cavitation. So it has ended up started burning. So that's, uh, that's pretty pretty hefty. So that was uh, about cavitation and it will get the cavitation effect right after the, the throttle point. So we're just going to look a bit at uh, a clip here. This water tunnel demonstrates the effects of water moving at high speed. So this guy is uh, starting up a, a uh, sort of like a wind tunnel, only sending water through it. And in the middle of the tunnel, he has this shape. This place. So the water is going to flow across the shape. Right now, it's flowing in a laminar float, so it's moving perfectly across it. And now they are increasing the flow rate, so now you can start seeing the stream of bubbles coming from the top there. This is just to uh, sort of illustrate that they are bursting as they go along and releasing quite a lot of energy. And the energy is actually sound energy that they are releasing. And here they have it in slow motion, just showing the bubbles forming and passing along. And then they are further over here, they are uh, collapsing. So the further and further away that we get along this tail, the more and more of the bubbles are collapsing. So if you, if you look at this, the first thing we see here is this very strong uh, vortex here. So you can see the worst part is at the top there, where you have that long tail, vortex tail of bubbles going. This is an experiment to show sort of what the, the sound energy, vibrating sound energy from the bubbles can do. So here they have a solid substance and they're putting this sound energy on it. Really gouge holes out of solid rock to resemble the I, thi I think it's actually a rock that they are putting in there, a piece of rock. Down 
And here you see how it's completely pulverizing the rock with the energy from, from these vibrations. But what would this have looked like during the flight? Yeah, and this is, uh, this is actually to show how how a, a huge area of valleys in the North Americas were created during a flood. Due to these cavitations, there is a lot of craters. So they, these smaller rocks on the seafloor created cavitation, and this gouged out craters in the, in the floor. But that's not really what we're after right now. Let me just stop that one. It was the cavitation itself that we were supposed to be looking at. So, cavitation. <coughs> uh, the bubbles form inside the fluid. And then as it moves along away from where it's formed, it starts to sort of collapse in on itself. And then as it collapses, it, it creates a jet, a sort of a plume of energy that is just shooting out from it. And if that energy hits the surrounding material of the fluid, uh, the material that is keeping the fluid in place, then it's going to have uh, more or less like you're blasting directly at the material or something. So it's, uh, it's uh, pretty effective. And here you actually see a very good picture of, of one of these bubbles as, it's, as it is uh, about to collapse here. So you've gotten this, this tunnel through the bubble. So that is right before it's bursting. And this is an, an impeller, so a propeller type of uh, thing. And all of this damage is not corrosion. Everything is cavitation. So it's just been blasted apart by the cavitation. As this one has been go rotating around and around and around and uh, moving fluid through it, the fluid has started cavitating and then just blasting holes in it. And this happens to, to large ship propellers and everything. They can be just uh, one, I know a couple of them, and that have been uh, uh, where the design was done poorly. They hadn't thought about cavitation. I saw this in a documentary once. Uh, and they did one voyage from Britain to the east coast of America, so one voyage across the Atlantic Ocean. And that was enough to, to uh, completely destroy the propeller. So the, the propellers of this huge, huge cargo ship was supposed to last for many, many, many years, but it only lasted one voyage across the Atlantic Ocean. So that's what cavitation can do to, to, a, uh, to steel material, basically. Then we'll continue on to look at different hydraulic fluids. So. Um, a hydraulic fluid is basically any fluid we can use that is suitable for transmitting pressure energy. So we, we can use water to do this because the main, uh, the main property that we need is that the fluid is incompressible. And water can be used, but as we know from uh, uh, our subsea technology, water is highly corrosive, so that we don't really want to to put water into our uh, metal, uh, metal components. So instead we use a lot of hydraulic oils. And these are usually based on hydrocarbons that we uh, get from reservoirs, so basic oil that we have gotten through drilling and rigs and stuff. But it could also be a plant oil. You can use vegetable oil uh, for, for it. The problem with vegetable oil is that, of course, it will deteriorate. It's like any other food. So, so as we go along, it will basically rot. So if you put this into your system for, and you intend to use it for a long while, then it's going to rot inside your system. So you will have a lot of bacterial growth and everything in there. So that's not really good. But if you're in a pinch anytime, you have a, maybe you have a, a small jack that you can use on your car, in the back of your car, and you're run out of... Uh, run out of oil in it, there's a, maybe there's a leak in it, so all of the oil has leaked out, then you can just go into your kitchen and get some, uh, get some of the olive oil or whatever it is you have, and you can fill it with that and use it. It's not a problem. You could have used water also. No problem. But I would, 
I would replace it afterwards to, to avoid any damage to the system. One thing we also want uh, or prefer is that we can uh, to have flame retardant hydraulic oils. As I mentioned with the cavitation, you, you can actually risk enough energy being released for the hydraulic oil, oil to self-ignite. So if you can have uh, some oil that really has quite a lot of difficulty burning, that's a good thing. <clears throat> and especially in hard coal mining, they use flame retardant oils in their equipment. You, you, you really don't want a fire breaking out in a coal mine because then it's going to just continue burning the coal until forever, uh, until there's no more coal left. There's actually uh, um, a mining village in, uh, on the east coast of uh, the United States where uh, a spark ignited coal dust inside a coal mine that was uh, dug out beneath uh, the village where all the workers were living. And that entire village is just it's deserted now. They, they've evacuated it and they're uh, in all of the holes where they entered the, uh, the coal mine. It's just flowing out uh, smoke all of the time. And slowly, as this is just smoldering underneath the earth, you are uh, sort of excavating all of the coal. So you get a huge, huge pockets of uh, just CO2 gas and smoke in there. But this also means that the village that's on top, uh, many of the houses have started sinking into the mine, and some of them have collapsed completely down holes into the mine and everything. So it's, uh, if, if you get a fire in a coal mine, that's really, really you basically can't extinguish it at all because it's just going to continue smoldering. And I think it's been burning for, I think it's like 20 or 25 years that it's been burning, so it's pretty hefty when it starts. Uh, you also use them in die casting machines because there you are using uh, liquid molten metal. You don't want, uh, want it to ignite the hydraulic oils that you are using to, to uh, uh, cast. Uh, the metal. Forging presses also. You have uh, red hot metal in close vicinity of the hydraulic oils. And also for the control systems for power plant turbines because you can get a lot of heat uh, from, uh, from creating, uh, creating, harvesting energy basically uh, through turbines. You remember this from, uh, from the thermodynamics. The efficiency of of different power plants isn't really all that high, uh, so much of the energy is lost as heat energy, uh, which means that also the control systems that are controlling valves and everything in the inside the power plants should be a flame retardant oil, just to be on the safe side. If you get an oil spill from uh, a leak from a, a coupling or anything, then uh, you would uh, you wouldn't want it to be sprayed onto something that's very hot and then start burning. Also melting plants and mill trains, the same stuff as the die casting machines and forging presses. You have very hot uh, steel uh, or iron or whatever close by. <coughs> the point of the, or the function rather, of the hydraulic oil is to transmit pressure. So it's supposed to move pressure from the source where you are compressing it and move it to where you want it to be whether it's a, a piston that you want to, uh, to extend or uh, basically move back and forth, or if it's uh, a rotating uh, motor that you want to, to keep on rotating, you will need pressure for it. But also, we need lubrication inside the system. So both lubrication in, in the general components of the hoses and everything, but especially like if you have a hydraulic motor, which is rotating, then you actually intentionally make sure that some of the oil will be leaking out of the system where you are supposed to have it. So it will be leaking out and, and basically lubricating all of the uh, movable parts inside the motor. This, uh, we will get back to this a bit later. Uh, it, it's basically just called leakage oil. So it's a part of the efficiency of a hydraulic system that you will have you, you can't really have a 100% efficient hydraulic system because you need to have leakage oil. Not only do you need to have it, but it's almost impossible to avoid it most places because you can't really create anything that's 
completely 100% without leaks when you are dealing with seals and everything and high pressures. It's uh, pretty difficult. But also, the hydraulic fluid acts to cool uh, the equipment that we're using. So it's also cooling uh, it as we are using it because it's transporting, uh, it's uh, being transported fairly cool um, uh, fluid from the reservoir. It's being transported through the system, maybe into a motor that's uh, running, uh, we're running it pretty hard, so it's starting to get warm. But there is constantly a fairly cool hydraulic liquid that's being pumped into it and then sent out of it. But as it's inside the rotating uh, motor, it will be getting a lot of the heat transfer from the motor into the hydraulic oil. But then it will continue on in the system, and after a while it will return to the tank. And if the tank has been designed correctly, it's supposed to sort of uh, be parked inside the tank for a while before it gets sucked up again. So the tank has to be adequately large in order for this to happen, so you have to have enough oil circulating. <coughs> so in fairly simple systems, it will be enough to just let the oil cool inside the tank, uh, for a while before it's sucked up again uh, and sent through the system. But for larger systems, uh, the, uh, it might be useful to have a cooling system so that you actually you, you send it through a, uh, a um, heat pump-like uh, uh, system where you basically just remove the heat from, from the uh, hydraulic fluid and just deliver it to the surroundings, much like the radiator of a car or, or uh, any oven that you would have at your home. Another thing that the hydraulic fluid does is to cushion vibrations. Because even though it is incompressible, it is still liquid, so it's, it's movable all the time. So if you have a lot of vibrations in your system, then you will, uh, will be cushioning them a bit by, by using hydraulic oil in it. And of course, we are talking about oils now, then we will have corrosion protection just by it being oils, basically. If you had, were using water, then you wouldn't have any corrosion protection. You would actually be worsening the corrosion uh, effects of the system. But since we are using mostly hydraulic oils, then we get sort of free of charge uh, a corrosion protection in there. But many of the hydraulic uh, fluids also have added corrosion preventer inhibitors, just to make sure that the system will last as long as possible. And also the hydraulic oil removes abrasions. So whenever you have movable parts in a system, no matter how well lubricated uh, the system is, so no matter, no matter how well you lubricate it, you will have steel in contact with steel at points. And when steel is in contact with steel and it is moving, you will have flakes of uh, just small particles of steel that will come loose. But when you are, have a hydraulic system, these particles will be caught by the hydraulic fluid and they will be transported into the tank, the, the reservoir, after a while. So they will just pass through the system and into the tank and that's when you, where you need to have a filter of some sort before you suck up the oil again and, and use it uh, in your system again. So that's the reason why if you're changing the oil on your car engine, it's black when, when you've used it for a while. Well, the, the oil that you are putting in, the fresh oil, it's uh, sort of a golden uh, honey-like color. So the blackness is, is uh, abrasion, uh, removal of abrasion. So it's just removing all kinds of, uh, uh, of particles from, from the uh, engine. Also, much of the reason why it's black in a car engine is also the fact that uh, you, get, you get leaks from the, uh, from the uh, piston area where, where you are exploding gasoline or diesel all the time. So you, you get some soot and ashes that uh, also get in there. <coughs> uh, you also have signal transmission. So you can use hydraulic systems to transmit signals and then Usually it is through, through pressure transmission. So you have 
basically beforehand agreed upon that, for an example, a pressure of 10 bars at the other end, that's going to, going to uh, um, elicit a reaction there. So something's going to happen if the pressure reaches 10 bar. So that when you increase your pressure up to 10 bar, then that will happen over the, uh, at the other end. Then you might have 10 bar increments. So for every 10 bar you increase the pressure, something new will happen. Maybe a new valve will open or, or whatever it is. So you can actually use use the hydraulic system just to uh, transfer signals. Yes? Uh, the cushioning, vibration cushioning. Yeah, it's a, uh, uh, e even though the, the uh, liquid is, is uh, incompressible, so that you can't really compress it, there is a slight give to it. Of course, you, you will, if you increase the pressure far enough get a large enough pressure, you will compress the fluid slightly, but it's nothing near what you can do with a gas. But still, this sort of slight give and take that you get, it will, uh, it will diminish all vibrations that you get. For example, if, um, uh, I didn't have that one up here, but, but if you have a piston, a piston on each end, and one of the pistons is being vibrated, then all of those vibrations have to travel through all of the hydraulic fluid you have, before it reaches the other piston. And it will be diminished as it moves along the hydraulic fluid and then you will just get a little bit of vibration on the other, other side there. So it's sort of just uh, acting as a, as a cushion between, between the two. <coughs> uh, yeah, that was the signal transmission. So um, we have many types of hydraulic fluids. So we're just going to look a bit at this before we, we have a break. And we usually use this standard, the ISO 11158, to, to uh, sort of divide our, uh, our uh, hydraulic fluids into different categories. And then we usually designate uh, the fluids with uh, different letters uh, to identify the active ingredients. And those letters are given by ISO 6743. There is uh, no need to really, really memorize these ISOs because they are written in the book. So just know that there is particular standards that are uh, doing this and then you can, if, if you need it for, uh, for a, a task or, or in the exam or anything, you can look it up what exactly what that ISO number is. Because I'll promise you that there are no, no engineers that go around remembering everything. If you work with it every day, then maybe you'll remember them. But uh, if you only every now and then work with it, you'll never remember uh, names of all the standards. So um, we use uh, an H uh, for hydraulic fluid, first of all, and then we can put identifying letters behind it uh, to tell if there, is, if there has been added something to make it flame retardant or, uh, or anything else of uh, special, the special characteristics that we will be looking at. Um, and after that, there is a number. And the number is the viscosity index, which tells us a bit about the viscosity of the fluid. And we'll be, be talking more about viscosity later on in the lecture. So the first one uh, we'll look at is the HL designation. So hydraulic liquid. I can't quite remember what the L stands for exactly. But the special characteristics when you have the HL is that it has increased corrosion protection and resistance to aging. So even though it's a mineral oil that we've uh, gotten up out of the ground, it will still deteriorate with age. So it will become, become uh, worse and worse at doing its job uh, as it ages. Not as quickly as a vegetable oil, but it will happen. So, which is one of the reasons why, why, you have to, uh, why they recommend that you uh, change your oil once a year, at least here in Norway, when you 
the further north you get, the more important it is to change your oil once a year on, on your car. In, in warmer climates, it might be that uh, you can uh, more go for the, the um, uh, distance driven so that you have a certain amount of kilometers that you can drive and then you have to change your oil. You basically have that here in Norway also, but if you haven't reached that amount of kilometers within a year, then you should change your oil anyway. That has to do with the temperatures and, and stuff. So, because lower temperatures uh, make the uh, make the oil thicker, so the viscosity changes as the temperature uh, changes. And as the oil uh, gets thicker, it also works uh, doesn't work as well as it's supposed to work. <clears throat> and uh, the sort of resistance to this uh, cooling effect um, of cold temperatures, uh, it gets worse and worse the older, older the uh, oil is. Yeah, I think we'll, uh, yeah, we can look at the range of applications uh, first before we do the break. So, systems in which high thermal stress occurs, so basically, if you are using it in, uh, in a, an engine, for an example, you would uh, want to use it. If you have uh, hydraulic systems that are close to a heat source or anything, then you would get high thermal stress. So you would want to use this kind of oil in it. Or corrosion due to penetration by water. If, if that is possible, then you would want this, this one. So it, it can withstand... Uh, water penetrating into the oil. So basically, if you have uh, possibilities of water getting into your system somehow uh, through valves or maybe leaking in somewhere, then it's nice to use use this oil because it it can handle a certain percentage of water in it without uh, without causing too much corrosion from it. Then we'll do a break.
That's better. <laughs> it's probably because I was charging it. I've been lying here on without charging for quite a while, so. <clears throat> yeah. Um, the next one we'll look at is designated HLP. And it has an increased resistance to wear, so that it, uh, it's uh, the, uh, the the hydraulic fluid itself can take a lot of beating, basically. It's a, so it's a it's a very very good hydraulic fluid for that. And the range of applications is basically the same as the previous one, but you can also use it for systems where you have uh, increased friction in the fluid uh, due to specific operation conditions or, uh, or design features that you're creating so that you're, if you have a system where you have, have quite a lot of friction occurring then you can use this one to, to, to uh, b basically make the, make the hydraulic fluid last longer without being uh, worn away. And the last one we have is HV, and it has an improved viscosity temperature performance, which means that it can, it can uh, perform at uh, more extreme temperatures than the rest of the hydraulic fluids. <coughs> and again, it's the same as the previous one for the uh, range of applications, but also used for greatly fluctuating and low ambient temperatures, so very cold situations you can use them. So without having checked this uh, particularly, I would uh, say that the, the HLP is a likely candidate for use in subsea equipment. And especially in subsea equipment where you might be using it uh, to the north of Norway, in close to the Arctic region, then I would use the, the HV one so that you have, have this uh, low ambient temperatures and greatly fluctuating temperatures uh, into account. Uh, because of course, when you get into the Arctic regions, you have a whole different range of design premises you have to uh, take into account when you're creating uh, systems there. <coughs> so we have, um, more about the different types of hydraulic fluids. Uh, we ha are going to look a bit at the, the flame retardant hydraulic fluids. Uh, and here we are looking a bit at both uh, hydraulic fluids containing water and those that are without water in them. But those that are without water in them, they have, uh, are synthetic, so they are not, they are not the mineral oils. Of course, the, the um, good thing about having a hydraulic oil with water in it is the fact that water isn't flammable, and in fact it will serve to, to sort of remove part of the heat, because it will absorb some of the heat, and it can't turn into, uh, into flames itself, so, so that it will sort of cool down the situation if you get, get to a point where a regular hydraulic fluid would have caught fire. No, we had an example first, before we look at the flame retardant ones, of course. So this one is, uh, is German, so hydraulic and then oil in German. So it's, uh, but I think the, the Liqui Moly company, I think it's actually British, I'm not quite sure, I haven't checked it. But this is an HLP 68. So that's the name of the fluid, HLP and then 68 which means that we have an H for the hydraulic fluid. We have an L for the increased corrosion protection and resistance to aging. We have a P for increased load capacity. So we can actually, we can uh, put more strain onto this, uh, this oil, make it work harder. And it has a viscosity index of 68. And again, that's the ISO standard for the viscosity index, which we showed on the last slide, the 6743. 
and we'll get get closer in on the viscosity uh, stuff a bit later on, as I mentioned. So then we're over on uh, the flame retardant hydraulic fluids. Those are uh, described in the ISO 12922. And here we have uh, four of them that we're going to look at. We have the HFA, which is composed of oil and water emulsions. Do you know what emulsions are? Have you learned that? Basically, have you ever eaten mayonnaise on your uh, food? Put mayonnaise on it? Yeah. Mayonnaise is an emulsion. So you have uh, an emulsion of, uh, what is it? It's, uh, can't remember what the components are, but it's some sort of vegetable oil, and I think it's eggs stuff that you are emulsifying. But the point is that usually when you're trying to mix oil and water, it won't mix because they will separate and the oil will go on top and the water will be below. But you can use emulsions and that's uh, sort of a, uh, a different way of mixing it which will in fact keep it mixed so that it won't separate afterwards. Because, of course, if you have oil and water inside the bottle and you shake it a lot, then you have a good mix of oil and water, but then when you let it rest for a while, it's going to separate. But if you have managed to create an emulsion, then it will stay mixed. So that's uh, what, the, what the mayonnaise is, ba basically. It's an emulsion, so it stays mixed. <coughs> um, and then you can actually get quite the high water content in it up to 98%. But then I would think, uh, just my intuition here, is that the oil component is, is more for the lubrication part of the system. And then you use the water to transmit the, uh, to transmit the pressure and do the work, basically. And then the, the oil does the lubrication and maybe some corrosion prevention. There might, of course, be, be other chemicals added to this also to, to help prevent corrosion since you have uh, such a high amount of water in it. But this is going to be great if you have 98% water in your hydraulic fluid. If it springs a leak and this is spraying onto something red hot, then it's not going to catch fire at all. It's just going to cool down whatever it is spraying on. So that's uh, perfect uh, for use in, in uh, situations uh, that are flammable. Actually, that is... Uh, I'll just do that as a curiosity before we continue. Did you know that in English, flammable and inflammable mean the same thing? You would think that inflammable was the opposite of flammable, but it isn't. Both of them mean the same thing. So I know that many, uh, uh, I, I think it's at least for, for the uh, fire engineer students that are here, uh, they try to stay to, stick to one of them and just, just use that one in order to avoid, uh, avoid confusion in their lectures when they're doing stuff in English. So it's, uh, I know that there's a, there, there's a lot of uh, different companies that have created uh, uh, sort of uh, fire safety equipment and stuff, and they've misinterpreted this and used inflammable for their fire safety equipment. So <laughs> because they mean that it won't catch fire, but, but of course inflammable means that it will burn. So that's something to just keep in mind to avoid confusions. <clears throat> the next one we'll look at is HFB, which is water oil emulsions and as you can see the uh, the sequence of words here has something to say because now we only have 40 percent water content in it so it's basically whatever is com coming first has the lowest amount in this emulsion but still 40 percent water in it it's still going to uh, have quite an effect if you have a leak there so you will have a good cooling effect for it then we have hfc which is aqueous solutions. So that is water and glycol. Do you remember we talked about glycol in, uh, in the subsea technology part? 
It's basically the, the sort of uh, the, the gel you have in the antibacterial stuff for, for your hands is glycol. And it, it is often used as, uh, for cooling, as a cooling fluid, uh, basically because uh, it doesn't cause corrosion. So if you want to avoid corrosion in your system, you will often use a water glycol uh, solution, like in your car engine. Uh, the cooling liquid that's in there has, is mostly water, but you, have, have, uh, you add some glycol to it. Oh, it's a cooling liquid you add, so it's more than just glycol, but much of it is, is glycol there. So <coughs> it is uh, it's good, and good for that. Um, and here you see we have uh, quite a range, actually, of water content in it, so it can be quite a lot of water. And then we have the HFDs, water-free solutions, which is phosphate esters. So this is purely chemical solution that is used, and I'm guessing that this 0 to 0 0.1 percent is um, more talk of contamination by uh, just the air humidity when they are creating this stuff. So that if they have, if it was a, when, when they created the solution, if it was a day with a high air humidity, maybe they got some, some of it caught inside their, their uh, liquid. <coughs> but it is basically completely water free. Then. Yeah, then I've forgotten to put on the, uh, click part on this one, but we'll just uh, do it as it is. So the characteristic requirements, uh, characteristics and requirements of the hydraulic fluid. We want to have the lowest possible density on the fluid, because of course that it means if we have a higher density on our fluid, we're going to have a heavier system. Just the weight of the system can be greatly affected by, by changing the density of the fluid, especially if you you're, you're talking about quite a, quite a high amount of liters that is going to be moved through a large hydraulic system, then it will be quite a lot of weight. So we, we want as low a possible density on it. We also want minimal compressibility. Ideally, it would be 100% incompressible, but as we've uh, talked about with water uh, especially, it's, uh, if you get to a high enough pressure, you will compress it slightly. We also want uh, the correct viscosity. And by the correct viscosity, we mean the correct ratio between lubrication and friction. Because if the viscosity is too low so that the, the fluid is too thin, then it's going to flow too easily, so it's not going to lubricate properly. But we don't want it to be too thick either, because that's going to cause a lot of friction. So it's going to lubricate very well, but it's going to cause a lot of resistance and friction inside the the uh, fluid itself. And we also want a good viscosity temperature ratio because we don't want the viscosity to change too much with, uh, within the operating range of temperature for, uh, for, uh, for the equipment that we're using. A and the same for pressure because viscosity does change as you increase the pressure. The viscosity is sort of deteriorates from our point of view. It becomes, uh, it becomes a bit worse from what we want it to be. We also want the fluid to be resistant to aging. So we want it to last for as long as possible. Preferably, we would want all of our hydraulic fluids to be flame retardant, if we could use that. But of course, a flame retardant hydraulic, oil, uh, hydraulic fluid is more expensive than a regular uh, oil. So. If you, if you can use a regular oil in your systems, you will use it for economic purposes. And we want material compatibility, because when we are creating systems, uh, the seals that we are using are often rubber solutions, uh, but they can be a lot of other, uh, they can be uh, uh, quite hard fiber solutions that we are using to seal uh, our openings. And some of them, react negatively when they come into contact with especially mineral oil. So if, if we are using seals in our system that will react negatively to mineral, mineral oil, we will have to go for synthetic oils, which are more expensive. 
So that is something we need to, to, to look at when we are creating the system, that uh, mm, we won't have any clashes of compatibility there. So if you're putting in the oil you think is the best for the system, but you uh, sort of uh, don't remember that one of the seals is going to be destroyed within a year if it's in contact with this oil, then it's not that good for the system. <coughs> yeah? Uh, th the main difference is uh, basically how it's uh, the components inside the oil. So the mineral oil is hydrocarbon. It's, uh, we've gotten it from inside the earth. It's just the regular oil that we get from there. While the synthetic ones have been, have been uh, created in labs, uh, basically. So they don't, they don't really have the same components uh, on a molecular level as the, as the uh, mineral ones. I can't really go into more detail because I don't really know the details exactly. But it is more expensive to create oil than just refining it from, from an uh, oil well. So, oops. so uh, that has uh, quite a lot to do with, uh, with the uh, expenses of, of the oil there. Uh, qu quite a lot of newer cars, uh, fairly new cars, use uh, synthetic uh, oil in their engines. So they become more expensive because of that. Um, other things we also have to look at is air separation. We, we uh, uh, don't want bubbles to form, especially uh, the cavitation kind, we don't want that. But also foaming and uh, everything, we don't want foam to be created by, uh, by the hydraulic fluid. That would be... Uh, it's it's not exactly a huge problem, but with air separation, you can get bubbles inside your system. So not, exact, not the cavitation bubbles, the tiny bubbles that will do a lot of harm to your system, but with air separation, you can get larger bubbles of air, and air is compressible. So if you're trying to, to extend the piston by putting pressure into it, and you have a huge air bubble inside the piston, then you're just going to compress the air. You're not going to extend the piston at all. But then suddenly, when the air has been compressed sufficiently, it will stop being compressed, and then the piston will shoot out. So at first, you will probably think that there is something wrong with the system. The piston isn't working, but I'm putting my pressure on here. There has to be a leak somewhere, and then suddenly the piston will start moving. So it's... Uh, it's a very negative thing to have air separation in it. And the foaming also can create similar uh, scenarios, especially in the tank. You, you can get, if you get a lot of foam there, it can start sort of blocking filters and uh, suction and stuff. So it's not, not very good to have foam creation in your hydraulic fluid. You also want it to be resistant to the low temperature. As I, uh, as I mentioned with the viscosity, which it, wor it worsens as it gets lower and lower temperature, the, the fluid thickens. So if it's resistant to fairly low temperatures, you will still ha have a good viscosity on the fluid, uh, even though it's cold. <coughs> you want to have the abrasion and corrosion protection, so you want to keep that uh, in mind also when you're choosing a fluid. And then you want the demulsification capacity, which is really difficult to explain. So it's, uh, uh, I think I'm actually going to try to, uh, to find it on, uh, on uh, Wikipedia here instead. Not Wikipedia, but... Um, So demulsification is the breaking of a crude oil emul emulsion into oil and water phases. So, so you basically don't want it to separate into its different components when you're doing it. So, uh, I couldn't find the correct words for explaining what demulsification was. So th this is going, uh, something that you don't want happening to your, your uh, hydraulic fluid. So you want it to, to stay in the shape that it's supposed to stay.
But one thing to keep in mind is that the very most important thing that we are looking for in a hydraulic fluid is the viscosity of it. And viscosity, you, you could explain it as being uh, more or less the pourability of, of the fluid. So how it acts when you're pouring it from a jug, basically. So that if you have a jug filled with water and a jug filled with uh, honey, and you're trying to pour them out, the water is going to splash all over the place, and the honey is just going to form into a huge drop that will slowly lower itself down. So that's the pourability, how well they are pouring. So the honey has a, a very high viscosity index, while the water has a very low one. And we are usually looking at the kinematic viscosity, which is millimeters squared per second uh, in the units. <coughs> and the viscosity of, of a fluid is determined according to, which is not a surprise, two different ISO standards that we can use to determine the viscosity of it. So they tell us uh, how we can, can determine it. So what kind of equipment we are going to use and, uh, and stuff like that to, to de determine it. But one of the, one of the uh, ways that we can do it is using a ball viscometer. And this is the figure 3.1 in the uh, book. So this one works. We have, we have a tube with, uh, filled with the hydraulic liquid. And there is also a ball inside the tube. And this is mounted on a, uh, on a stand here where we can rotate it. So if we rotate this shaft, we will uh, rotate the entire tube so that we can switch the ball from being at the bottom to the top if we want to. And then the viscosity uh, is measured on on uh, how quickly it drops through the uh, liquid there. <coughs> so we measure the speed of the ball as it drops through it, and uh, this will give us the, the uh, kinematic viscosity. <coughs> um, yeah. So the viscosity is, is uh, uh, divided into viscosity classes. Again, we have an ISO standard which decides this. Uh, I think um, in the library it is possible to to get access to to most of the the standards with sort of a, a student's access, so that you can view them. You can't print them or anything, but you can view them. I'm not quite sure. You, we would have to ask the. Uh, uh, the women that work up there in, in the library, they are very good at, uh, they, they know everything about this kind of stuff. So if, if you really would like to look at the standards just to see uh, what exactly is it this standard is uh, saying, just for your own uh, curiosity's sake and your own learning, uh, I would recommend going up there and asking them to see if, if this one is available uh, or any of the other ISOs are available there. Because I know that not all of them are available, but some of them are, so it's nice to just check. <coughs> and according to this uh, ISO standard, we get the maximum and minimum viscosities at 40 degrees Celsius. So why exactly they have chosen to do it at 40 degrees Celsius, I'm not quite sure, w would probably have been more uh, more useful to use 18 or 20, which is the usual temperature in a room, but uh, <laughs> for some reason it's, it's exactly 40, so. <coughs> and then we have the different viscosity classes. Uh, so we have the 10, which has a maximum of nine and a minimum of 11. So you see here they use maximum is the lowest number and minimum is the largest number. 
of, of the kinematic uh, viscosity. And then we have the 100, which is 90 to 110. So you can see it's, it's basically the same, only you have one more digit down there. And then we have uh, several in between here, 22, 32, 46, 68. That was the one we had in the example, the HLP 68. So here we can see we have 61.2 to 74.8 in the kinematic viscosity of it. Yeah? It's because we, uh, the, the, the smaller the number is, the more easily pourable, the, the more easily you can pour the, the liquid. So that honey would be, will have a very high number, while water will have a very low lo number, because water is easy to pour, while honey sort of sticks to everything and flows very, very slowly. And we're interested in having a low viscosity. So for uh, sort of the, the maximum minimum is uh, is uh, based on uh, what purpose we are going to put the liquid to, not the exact value. So we can get uh, a maximum of nine uh, in kinematic viscosity, which means that it will, that's as quickly as it will be uh, able to pour. And the minimum is 11, which is the slowest that it will be pourable. So it's a bit, bit difficult to get your head around the first couple of times, but uh, as you get along, you will see that it does make sense if you look at it from uh, a user's perspective and not from a mathematics perspective for the numbers. Then we have a, a nice little clip here for the, just to show. So that's a low viscosity and that's a high viscosity. So low viscosity is very pourable. And the high viscosity here is very not pourable <laughs> compared to it. So this is more like a syrupy molasses uh, thing. Back to the table. Uh, this one? Yeah? Yeah, the, the you get, uh, so uh, the 90, it's something that's very uh, not pourable. So it's very much like honey or syrup. And then as you move up here, you are closing in on water, that it's flowing very rapidly out of the container. And that's, wh that's why we have the, the maximum over the smallest number and the minimum over the, the, uh, the largest number because you want it to be, be uh, more pourable. <laughs> so the viscosity classes uh, tells us quite a lot about the application we can use, uh, ap application ranges for the hydraulic uh, fluid. So that if we are in a, in a system where we need, uh, we need very much lubrication and it doesn't really matter if we have a lot of friction, we can use a high viscosity class because uh, it can flow very slowly, it's not a problem. There will be more friction and heat generated uh, when it's flowing slowly, but you will get the correct amount of lubrication in your system. But if you need your fluid to move really, really fast through the system, if, you, if you're running a, a hydraulic motor, so you need, to, you need to keep this one running and rotating, then you would like a low viscosity so that it's, you have as little friction as possible. You will have less lubrication, but you, will, you want the friction to be as low as possible in the hydraulic oil. Uh, sometimes we use motor oils or transmission oils from, from the, uh, the uh, car industry. 
they often have their own, own uh, classes for viscosity. And they are, in fact, uh, changing uh, slowly but gradually into the ISO system also. So often, on, uh, if you go to, to the shop to, to buy motor oil, you will see the SAE rating on it. And then you would probably see the ISO rating somewhere on it also. And I think and, uh, in a couple of years, as we've passed along, maybe it's, it will be the ISO rating that is the most visible on, on the packaging. And then the SAE rating will be in a smaller writing somewhere else on, on the packaging. And then in the end, it will all be ISO uh, when they manage this transition properly. <coughs> so the, the different different uh, uh, motor and transmission oils uh, that can be used. Basically, they perform a lot of hydraulic function inside uh, a car engine, uh, the motor oil. Uh, and also, the, the transmission oils, which is in the gearbox of the car, it doesn't really have much of a hydraulic function that is more purely lubrication. But it needs to have a good viscosity because it needs to... Uh, it's uh, lubricating a lot of gears that are moving very quickly. They're rotating very quickly. So it needs to have uh, a low viscosity so that it flows well and sort of fits in between all of the teeth on the gears. <clears throat> so as long as you have the SAE uh, uh, class uh, hooked up to the correct ISO class, you can uh, exchange your hydraulic fluid with motor oil if needed. There are different, a couple of examples of uh, motor oils. And here is a typical uh, SAE. Uh, here you even see on this one, it says SAE, and it's 0W, which means that it's the winter rating, so it's for cold temperatures. Uh, then the SAE rating is zero for this one, and then for regular uh, sort of summer temperatures, it's for, for 20 uh, on that one. <clears throat> Here you have one 5W30, 10W30, uh, many different types of them. <clears throat> and now we're going to look a bit at the, the, the connections between the ISO and the SAE class. So we'll start off at very thick uh, hydraulic fluid, 100 in uh, viscosity class. That's a 30 in the SAE system, so it's a very thick fluid. So, so in, a, in, a, in a transmission, uh, in a gearbox, on a car, or in, in the engine, you would want the oil to be very thick when you are uh, in the summertime uh, because you wanted, to, you wanted to give the correct amount of lubrication as the, uh, motor, uh, as the engine is starting. Because as it is starting is when you are getting the most strain on all of your mechanical components. When it is uh, running at a... Uh, uh, at a steady, uh, steady pace, then you won't get that much. Uh, and as it gets uh, heated up and it gets to the uh, correct operating temperature, then of course the, the, uh, uh, the motor oil will be thinner because it's warmer. It is often around, around 100 degrees uh, operating temperature on uh, car engines. So it will be, the oil will be a lot warmer and will flow a lot better. It will be a more pourability in it. But you want that, you want it to be a bit thicker uh, at the start because you want it to give the correct lubrication there. So that's why it's often, uh, often a fairly high class for the, the summertime then. <clears throat> and it is often used for stationary systems in closed rooms with high temperatures. So basically, if you have a, a Hydro if you're using it in a hydraulic system, you're using it in something that is pl placed in a room, and this is where it operates all the time. It's not something that you can move around or uh, connected to a, a truck or something where you're, you're driving it and using it. <clears throat> so it's a stationary system, and usually you have high temperatures, which, is, uh, which correlates perfectly with the uh, car engine. So you want the as the temperature rises in the car engine, you want it to perform as it's supposed to perform with oil. Yeah? Uh, it's not a fixed rate, so it, it depends on the fluid, basically. But it will be a f fixed rate for each different fluid. 
basically so you will have charts for for viscosity temperature ranges uh, or ratios and stuff so but it will change if you look at a different viscosity class or a different fluid it will be a different chart that you need to look at so it's uh, individual for each of the oils then we go down to the 68 which we had in our example so that's a a 20 for summer temperature or a 25 for winter conditions so the, uh, it's really thick uh, it's still it's not as thick as the uh, the, um, the top one but it's still a thick one and it is used it uh, has the same range of applications so it's uh, stationary systems enclosed rooms and high temperatures then you have the ISO class 46 so remember we go from 100 to 10 so now we are a little bit past the, the midpoint. And then we have uh, 15 winter and 20 winter uh, for motor oils. And that is normal temperatures. So if you're operating a system at normal temperatures, so if you're in a, a, a regular room, if it's just a, a uh, hydraulic system that's running over in a corner of a huge workshop or something, the temperature will be about 18 degrees, most likely inside the workshop. If it's colder, the workers will probably be complaining. So that's a normal temperature range for it to work in. So then you usually have these mid-range oils. So then you have uh, really low viscosities, 22, 32, and uh, 10 winter, which is outdoor use and mobile hydraulics. So for, uh, for, um, for cranes, winches, uh, different if you have a truck that can lift uh, lift the bed on uh, on the truck so uh, anything like that will be will be mobile hydraulics then you have ISO 15 which is 5w which is colder areas and this is often it is often zero or 5w which is in the, the uh, engine uh, motor oils at least here in in the northern parts of the world because you, you get really cold winters, so you want it to operate well in the winter. And then you're down at 10, which is the same as zero uh, W, and still for, for colder uh, climates. <coughs> so you're often talking about around, around freezing or actually freezing so so uh, minus degrees basically yeah that was uh, it for the lecture itself today now we're just going to look through the learning goals that we had at the start so we were going to be able to explain throttle points and the effects of throttling so we've looked at that you will have to be um, your own judges if you are actually able to explain it or not so if, if you feel that you're still not able to explain it, I would advise that you uh, read more on it uh, before the next uh, lecture. And then we see the, the one we looked at the most uh, there. We were also supposed to be able to explain cavitation and the effects of cavitation. And we looked at this, uh, these bubbles that burst and create, create huge amounts of energy that destroy materials. We were to become familiar with hydraulic fluids, so we looked at different hydraulic fluids, and we were to become familiar with the role of viscosity in the hydraulic fluids. We've also looked at that. And we are going to be able to distinguish the properties of hydraulic fluids based on the viscosity index. And we know that a high viscosity index means that it is very thick, flowing poorly, and then a low viscosity index means that it is very thin, so it flows well. And but doesn't lubricate as well. That was it for today. I've even put in references, so you can go and check them out on the internet if you want to. So uh, I'll be putting this one up on front, but I don't know if it will be today or during the weekend or on Monday, so, but, but it will be up on front.